Right, thank you, Robin, and thank you for all for turning up. I want to start first by demonstrating to you how old I am, because this looks as if it's written in parchment. It also takes us back to a paper written in 1983 where we looked at the possible effects of climate change in Europe. And one of our conclusions was that the quality of the Bordeaux and the Champagne would improve. It was suggested that this added the right air of frivolity to all this climate change nonsense. We now know that there has been some good vintages of Bordeaux and Champagne. I think we should also raise a glass of that good Bordeaux and Champagne to the Nobel Peace Prize people who have just awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and Al Gore for raising this issue. There's an early coincidence between the Industrial Revolution and Coral Reefs. 1769, James Watt painted his improved steam engine. He also came from my original part of the world, where one of the main fossil fuels, coal, was easily accessible. The then main greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, was 270 parts per million. A year later, we have Joseph Banks sailing up the Great Barrier Reef with Captain Cook, and just saying how spectacular it was. Joseph Banks was also a modern man of his times. He was one of the first to go out and buy these newfangled steam engines, and therefore set in a train of events that he couldn't actually imagine at that time. There's a natural greenhouse effect, and without it we wouldn't be here. The Earth would be 30 degrees cooler. Unfortunately, we've put too much in the atmosphere, and it's trapping heat and warming the planet. If we look at the history of the human influence on climate, we see various steps along the way. The end of the 19th century, Swedish physicists actually published a paper saying, if you put more burned fossil fuels, you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and you'll cause global warming. The way we used energy changed at the start of the 20th century. Henry Ford probably started the consumer society because not only did he produce cheap cars, to the horror of other industrialists, he doubled the workers' wages so they could actually afford those new cars. I'll come back to Mr. Callender in a second. We started direct measurements of carbon dioxide in the late 1950s. First mass coral bleaching, round about 1979, and along the right-hand side you can see the level of CO2. It's already gone up significantly from the late 18th century levels. The first Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change Assessment, 1990. They were, as been mentioned earlier today, they're quite a conservative body. They said it wasn't yet possible to attribute this to climate, the climate change to human activities. Often forgotten is 1992, the United Framework Convention on Climate Change, where many countries agreed to stop dangerous interference with the climate system and allow ecosystems to adapt naturally. <coughs> 1995, maybe it's humans. 2001, likely it's humans. 2007, it's very likely. We've increased the main greenhouse gas by 40% since the Industrial Revolution, and there are also eight times as many people on the planet. Mr. Callender, and the Mr. is important, presented a paper to the British Royal Meteorological Society in 1938 in which he presented evidence that not only climate change could happen, that it was happening, and it was due to human activities. He actually thought it would be a good thing because it would stop the glaciers coming back. We have evidence from instrumental records going back to the end of the 19th century that global temperatures are getting warmer. We can also look further back through a variety of what we call proxy climate records, substitutes for the instrumental records, such as trees, sediments, speleotherms from caves, coral, which I'll come to again in a bit, and ice cores. All of these show, when we look over the past one to 2,000 years, just how unusual this recent warming is. We have evidence from the physical world. The Arctic sea ice is melting, the mountain glaciers are retreating, the permafrost is melting, and we have evidence from biological systems that they are experiencing a warmer world. Migratory birds are arriving sooner, 
and my favourite example is from Britain, where they actually have a lawn mowing season. And the final author in this area, Mr. Grissomthwaite, writes down every time he mows his lawn. And they were able to compile these records, and looking at them, they've been able to demonstrate that the lawn mowing season in Britain has increased by a month already. <laughs> So what's all this got to do with coral reefs? At the heart of tropical coral reefs is a very special relationship between the coral animals and coral plants, the plants called zooxanthellae. They give the corals the energy to withstand the forces of erosion on coral reefs and build coral reefs. Coral bleaching, which many of you will have heard about, is when the coral is stressed. This relationship breaks down, the partners get divorced, and there can be a number of outcomes for them that. Why does it happen? The corals are growing, living very close to their upper thermal tolerance limit, only one to two degrees below that. And the mass coral bleaching events that we've been seeing since the late 1970s are all due to thermal stress. This is a direct consequence of the global warming that we've observed to date, which has been comparatively moderate. This is a picture showing the observed warming of the Great Barrier Reef. It's significantly warmer than it was at the end of the 19th century. And by the end of this century, even with a low emission scenario, it could be one degree warmer than it has been in the past. Both of these scenarios by 2035 take the water temperatures outside the range that corals have experienced in the recent past. Now, people think of corals, reefs, all these pretty little corals. I like these corals, which are the big, massive corals. And they are history books. We can take cores from them, and we can look at the growth bands, which are a bit similar to trees. And these have told us a wealth of information about the Great Barrier Reef in particular. The water temperatures are warmer, the rainfall's more extreme, fresh water influences are getting further out, the consequences of European settlement, changing water quality, etc. And this coral actually stopped growing in 1998 as a consequence of coral bleaching. Another consequence of global warming is increased intensity of tropical cyclones, which we've already observed. We know what happens on land. This is the white star there, McDonald Reef in 2004. That's what that reef looked like the following year. That reef can recover. It would normally recover, but we have to take out the other disturbances and levels of stress that we're putting on corals. A more insidious, insidious effect of global warming is about 30% of the excess carbon dioxide has gone into the oceans, and this is changing the ocean chemistry, and is going to make it harder for corals to form coral reefs. At present, the areas in orange and red, the water chemistry is good for coral reefs to grow. If we project the increasing amount of carbon dioxide going into the oceans, the reduced pH. By the end of this century, the yellow and green areas, they are not really hospitable for corals to build their skeletons in the tropical ocean regions. So a change in climate for coral reefs. We're already seeing war warmer water temperatures, coral bleaching, coral diseases, ocean acidification, stronger tropical cyclones, more extreme rainfall and river flow events, sea level rise, though that's probably not going to be a main problem for coral reefs, and other components of the atmospheric circulation system will all change and affect coral reefs. We know global climate is changing due to human actions. Climate has changed in the past, but not at the current rate and with the present human population and already heavily impacted ecosystems. We've already seen regional consequences. Impacts on coral reefs are already evident. A key issue is the rate at which this current change is happening and the climate for the foreseeable future will be changing. We're not immediately leaping to a new climate state to which things can adapt. So the appearance and structure and biodiversity of coral reefs will change. And we also have to remember that coral reefs are not just corals. We are very fortunate in this country in that we can value them just because they're pretty, but millions of people depend on coral reefs for their livelihoods. To get to a future with coral reefs, we have to re drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions to avoid the unman unmanageable consequences of climate change. 
We have to adapt to what we can't avoid. And we have to enhance ecosystem resilience. We need to make all our ecosystems, including coral reefs, as healthy as possible so they're better able to cope. In conclusion, you often think of bodybuilders, bodybuilders as fairly monosyllabic. But there's one former Austrian bodybuilder who's now the leader of the seventh largest world economy. And at a recent United Nations meeting, he articulated what we have to do very well. Action, action, action. Thank you. Mm -hmm.